Greetings. I happen to be Rob Redden, the minister for the Grover Beast Church of Christ. And if you've been listening to this, I'm sure you're tired of hearing that. But I am very blessed to be able to uh, spend as many years as I have with one congregation over 40 years. And we're still thriving. And we're still trying to equip the church for the work of ministry, Ephesians 4.11. And uh, we're sharing with you some things that we've been sharing with our church family. The congregation is located at Grover Beach, California, on the beautiful Central Coast. And I brag that we have the best weather that you could find anywhere in the United States. Possibly the world, I don't know. But it's certainly a wonderful place to live. And we enjoy the people here. And our congregation is a very loving family. And we would invite you, encourage you to come and visit us if you're in the area. We're located at 202 South 8th Street. And that's one block south of the main street called Grand Avenue. You know, the last couple of weeks we have been discussing the importance of ministries and our place in the local church family. And we notice that Ephesians 4 places heavy responsibility upon leaders and preachers and, and teachers to assist church members, church family members, I'd like to say, to discover their talents and to help develop them in the various ministries of the church. And in our congregation, we plan to present a survey to discover the members' interests and talents uh, in the various ministries of the church very soon. Today, I want to focus upon a description of the areas where ministries of the church may be developed for us. And looking around the various churches in and out of our fellowship, one discovers an array of activities promoted for the involvement of membership. Gyms for the youth are built. Members' talents in, ta uh, in crafts are supported as ministries. Choirs are promoted for gifted singers. Musicians are given their opportunity to show off their musical skills. I'm sure if I research this in depth, I could discover much more and that just about anything of interest that is wholesome could be found supported as the work of the church. Now, I'm not wanting to ruin other people and their spiritual aspirations, and I don't want to rain on anybody's parade. And I would be the first to see the value of many things that might be questionable. But those who are more interested in maintaining tradition may not see it as something of worth that fits into the work of the church. You know, there are some churches that won't even provide a kitchen in the church building. Although the churches of the first century met in homes and ate meals before or after their worship services. And if someone asked me where do we get the authority to eat in a church building, I would always tell them it's found in the same verse that authorizes the owning of a church building in the first place and becoming a nonprofit, non taxable corporation with the state. Obviously, there is some expediency or some freedom in the way that we fulfill the work of the church namely evangelism, edification, and benevolence. I want to be biblical, don't you? I want to live my practice to what is approved by the Lord and, and not that which is approved by man. I don't want to follow fads, but facts of Scripture. I don't want to appeal to man with gadgets, hooks, or entertainment. But I don't want to rule out healthy, uplifting get-togethers like game nights on church property. But we must always be careful how we use the Lord's funds. 
So this is why I'm planning a series on the work uh, or mission of the church. My first lesson today is on evangelism. The second will be on edification. Third, benevolence. And finally, worship. Each of these areas have led to controversy and division in Christendom. And not only in the churches of Christ, by the way. Extremes divide. To take liberties with the word of God is divisive. Where the word limits, that's the limits that we should place upon ourselves. And to bind where the Lord is not bound is equally divisive. You know, I've been known as a middle-of-the-road thinker. Although some may say I lean more toward being broader-minded than they are, but I still consider myself bound by Scripture, and I hope you are too. So it depends on where on the spectrum one is looking to determine, you know, one's estimation of another. If you're ultra-conservative, anything different is liberal. If you're liberal, anything different from your point of view is ultra-conservative. Where's the middle ground here? You know, I make it my aim not to just parrot what others have taught me. I've been taught by some of the finest professors and scholars, and I am proud to have been able to do that. I've had a broad education in the schools of my church fellowship as well as outside my fellowship. I have read widely and try to be as objective as possible, always being alert on my own presuppositions and prejudices. Of course, I have deep core convictions that have been settled through the years, and I will defend these to my dying day. We must understand that division is sinful. I, however, know that people may have to take a stand against error and separate from that error. The teachers of error are the really the causes of division. To take the viewpoint that over 300 plus congregations, pardon me, denominations are a good thing is a denial of the will of God and the prayer of Christ for unity before he was arrested and executed. That prayer is found in John 17, which has often been called the priestly prayer of Jesus. In verse 21 following, Jesus is praying for his followers that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Division causes disbelief. Verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love me even as you have loved me. You know, I've heard the story of three different missionaries going to a mission field and they were from different denominations. And after hearing all three points of view, they told the three missionaries, go back home and resolve your differences before you try to convince us. Good point. For someone to say, you know, denominations are good because each denomination appeals to certain people 
and certain practices and certain beliefs, and that's good for them. Where in the world do you find that in Scripture? You know, Paul may have had Jesus' prayer in mind when he wrote the divided church at Corinth. Now, Paul didn't tell the faithful of that church to leave the divisive members and form a new church, but he worked with them to rescue them from denominationalizing themselves. He wrote in chapter 1, 9 and 10, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, that you may be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, of course, Paul is not saying that there is no line to draw with false teachers. John made the deity of Christ a test of fellowship in John, 2 John 9 and 10. But most divisions have been over opinions and quarrels and not doctrine. I know that's been true among our fellowship over the years. So yes, we must be diligent and passionate about learning God's word, about ministry, and seek to preserve the biblical teaching about this. The devil is good about entering the church through the back door, where he is least likely to be seen, and he may work on our own interests and preferences if we're not careful. So looking at the work of the church its pre preeminent place in ministry of the church is evangelism. Evangelism comes from two Greek words, which means to share the good news. Hence, to preach and to teach others the good news, the gospel, which also means good news. You know, I've said this over and over again. We are saved to save others and keep the saved saved. That should be our goal, our mission. Every lost soul is a mission field and every Christian is a missionary. If we don't believe this, we are void of biblical understanding. It's something that I, nor any other preacher, need to prove because it seems to be labor the obvious from Scripture. But some things bear repeating, and it is this. Evangelism is foremost in church ministry because it provides the answer to the needs of humanity. All adults are sinners and stand condemned, Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one, says Paul. Now, please grasp this thought. God judges sinners not as man judges himself, but he judges mankind by his holiness and righteousness. A just judge cannot show favoritism even if his own son is convicted of a crime and stands before him convicted and stands there to be sentenced. He must sentence him without any bias as if he were a complete stranger. Otherwise, he would not be a just judge. The judge may only know his son as a good young man, a responsible and loving son. But the father doesn't know the secrets in his heart until they come out. You know, it's very, very evident that even upright citizens may be discovered to be criminals. Take, for example, Dennis Rader. 
known as the BTK Murderer. It stands for Bind, Torture, and Kill. He was an upright citizen in his hometown of Wichita, Kansas. Outstanding member of the Lutheran Church, becoming the president of the church council. Also a Cub Scout leader. He was known in the community as a normal, polite, and well-mannered man. But he was a sadistic murderer of men, women, and children. Sure, this is an extreme example, but again, only God knows a person perfectly. Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 2.11, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit that is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, none knows except for the spirit of God. You see, it's clear that we serve an omniscient God that knows all that there is to be known. And Hebrews 4 and verse 13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open or naked and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We will, we will stand in judgment and our whole being, thoughts, and actions will be known by God as they are even today. So just because we think based upon our own experience or knowledge that a certain person, because of his goodness known to us, that there is no way that God could keep him out of heaven. And yet that is not the biblical truth. Will you just study with me with an open mind and see? I want to address you for a few moments concerning this man, Cornelius. If there was anyone who could have been saved by his or her own goodness, it was Cornelius. And I do believe this is recorded not only because he was the first convert from the non-Jewish people, but because by the world's standards, he would pass the test and be ushered into heaven at death. Let me begin reading in Acts 10, one following. Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. That's enough. Punch his ticket for heaven. At his funeral, everybody will say he's in heaven because how they knew him. How could a good God keep such a person out of heaven? Well, God arranged that Peter would pay him a visit. And those who went to Peter to invite him to Caesarea told him about Cornelius. From what they gathered, Cornelius, verse 22, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, is well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews. Again, that sounds like he's got a punch ticket for heaven, right? And by the world's standard and opinion, the answer would be yes. But let's go on. Peter preached the gospel to him of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, and then said in verse 43, of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. But Cornelius knew nothing about Jesus Christ while he was this devout man who feared God. But yet Peter says, belief in the name of Jesus Christ is needed for the forgiveness of sins. 
if that's the case, and if we can think rationally, the conclusion is that there was something about Cornelius that God saw that didn't balance the scales at all. Now, whenever he completed his ser sermon, he had to address something like baptism. And he spoke to the Jewish brethren with him and asked if there was any objection for him being baptized. And then we discover in verse 48, he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Have we ever came across that expression, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, before? Look at Acts 2, 38. When Peter convicted the Jews of crucifying their Savior, in verse 37, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, we need to know what to do to be saved from this guilt. And Peter responded, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you think Paul was preaching something different from Peter? Both were gifted from God to speak by revelation. There is no consistency. Whatever was required of the Jew was required of the Gentile. Otherwise, this Gentile would not have been asked to be baptized or commanded to be baptized. When he said, those that believe in Jesus Christ will be forgiven of their sins and then commanded to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, he obviously told them, this is what you need to do. Rehearsing these events in Jerusalem before the Jewish church, Peter told them how he learned of Cornelius. And he said in chapter 11, verse 13, And he reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. In verse 14, And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved you and your household. Did you hear that? What kind of words? Well, he preached the gospel about the death, burial, and resurrection and the necessity of baptism. These were the words by which they, Cornelius, his family and friends, could be saved. If he was saved before he heard the gospel, or before baptism, he contradicted the Apostle Peter. We know that's not the case. What I'm saying about this is, I'm trying to show that all sinners, no matter how good they are in the world's eyes, need a Savior. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, the good, bad, and ugly, as Clint Eastwood would say, no one comes to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. Larry West of We Care Ministries told the story to illustrate that all are lost regardless of how good they are in the world's eyes. I will share the story, but in my own words. Picture a group of people out on a walk, and suddenly a Kodiak bear appears and begins running after them. All turn and run away as fast as they can. Now the faster runners felt that all they had to do was outrun the slow runners. And certainly, once the bear caught 
a slow runner, they, the rest, could flee to safety. But they came to a cliff. And so the other side of the cliff was 30 feet away. If they turned around, they would all die. If they jumped, they would probably die. That was their only chance. Now, the record for a running jump is 29 feet, four and a quarter inches by Mike Powell. Now, it makes no difference how close you get to the other side, you die. You could be a foot away or 20 feet away. The result is the same, death. You get my point? No matter how close you and I are to perfection, we're still sinners and will not be saved by our own goodness. The sin, no matter how secret or how flagrant it is, outweighs any goodness that we have. Back to the young man before his father in court. It makes no difference how good this young man was in the eyes of the father. The jury, based on the evidence, convicted him as a criminal. You know, of course, if there was a bridge that supports the weight of humans spanning the gap, which breaks with the weight of the Kodiak bear of 2,500 pounds, one would be saved. The Bible is clear. That bridge that spans the tide is none other than Jesus Christ. Without the cross, without the death of Christ and his shed blood, there is no remission of sins. In Romans 5 and verse 10, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death, the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we'll be saved by his life. I believe the resurrected life. The New Living Translation often clarifies some texts. And the rendering of Hebrews 9, 14 is very effective. Let me share. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our hearts from deeds that lead to death so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself as to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. The blood of Christ, our Savior, spans the gap between us and salvation. And we must accept that, no matter how good we are. You see, the need of evangelism is established by the human predicament, sin and condemnation. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Each year, new medicines are being produced to cure cancer. We've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Now, what if a research biochemist found the cure and enjoyed research so much that he just ignored sharing his discover, discovery with the world? Wouldn't you question his sanity? Why then would a church who believes that the gospel, the good news, is the cure of the malady of sin, the worst fatal disease of humanity, a disease that brought on one's, by one's own choice, neglect its responsibility to the world? In Romans chapter 10, Paul wrote, beginning with verse 14, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they be sent? Just as is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good tidings of good things. 
However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Do we not see that evangelism is the major, the primary work and ministry of the church? Now, and the church is the instrument for this work of evangelism. In Acts 13, we find the church was divinely directed to send out missionaries, Paul and Barnabas. We read now, there were Antioch in the church, prophets and teachers, and Barnabas and Simeon, and Lucius and Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart me for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. This was one of the most revolutionizing periods of world history. By the end of the first century, 70 years after the death of Christ, the church swelled over, over a million. And it began with 500 believers. There was a metropolitan city in the Mediterranean world that didn't have a church of the Lord's people. Before Paul's conversion, it was he was employed by the court of Jerusalem to hunt down Jewish Christians who were considered renegades and apostates and to arrest them by force and bring them to Jerusalem for trial as heretics. This persecution broke out with the, with the murder of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And that persecution was so intense in Jerusalem that many believers fled the city. And it was said that whoever left the city, wherever they went, they preached the word. These weren't ordained preachers. Even the apostles stayed home, it says. My point is everyone saw themselves as bearers of the good news of Christ. And wherever they went, they established churches. And this was the beginning of what we call today as personal evangelism. Taking it personal. And this passion for the lost reminds me of a powerful statement made by an infidel or agnostic. And I don't hesitate to share it with you. If I firmly believe, as millions say they do, he says, that the knowledge and practice of Christianity influences destiny in another world, Christianity would be to me everything. Christianity would be my first waking thought and my last image before sleep sank me into unconsciousness. I would labor in his cause alone. I would take thought of the moral and eternity alone. Earthly consequences should never stay my hands or seal my lips, and I would esteem one soul gained for heaven worth a lifetime of effort. And I would go forth to the world and preach Christ in season and out of season, and my text would be, What should it profit man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I understand that we can't all be missionaries in foreign fields, but as the churches supported Paul, we can do the same. We can support missionaries. We all can't preach from pulpits, but we can share what we know with the lost. If we know what to do to be saved, we can share that with others. We must be evangelistic minded and seek to be on board with the greatest mission of the church, and that is evangelism. Someone wrote this timely poem. If you can't sing like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, if you can tell the love of Jesus. You can tell. You can say that he died for all. If you cannot cross the oceans and the heathen land explore, you can find a heathen closer. You can find one just next door. The church is, is the Lord's missionary society. The Lord didn't institute or give freedom 
to establish institutions to do the missionary work for the church. The church mission is to be evangelistic minded. Again, the church is the body of Christ. And as Christ, we seek and save the lost. The body of Christ is the representative of Christ on earth and must carry out his mission of saving the lost. Today, I ask you, are you serving in your local church family to help in assisting this great work? As a believer, I'm saved to save others. And if I am not trying to do this as a part of my personal ministry and mission, am I pleasing the Lord? I think you know the answer to this question. And if your congregation is not evangelistic-minded, go to the leaders and ask them why they are not more involved in the primary mission of the church. Let's think souls. And let's not walk in the world's viewpoint that just because a person is good, that he's not lost in sin. Remember Cornelius, and it will help us get the right point of view, God's point of view. Without Christ, people are lost, regardless of how close they are to perfection. And the bottom line, none of us are even close. Let's pray. Father God, help us to have a thirst that Jesus had to do your will, to save the lost. Help us to have a love for others and to seek and save those that are lost. Help us to work through the ministry of the church. Help us to yield ourselves to the leadership of the church so that we can participate in the greatest mission on earth. And that is to save souls for you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for listening and giving me some of your time. I encourage you to visit a Church of Christ near you on this Lord's Day. Or, or the next Lord's Day, whenever it's uh, closest to you. And we hope that you will tune in next week when we'll follow up with another lesson on the mission and work of the church. And we hope that you would invite others to listen in. We have a lot to say, and we, we assure you that we will back up everything we say from God's holy word. And now, as I close, I want to wish you the best and pray that God will bless you and keep you until we meet again. Goodbye.